Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Championship Sports. By now, all of you have heard about the tragic and untimely death of Bruiser Brody. Very disappointing to all of us. He was a longtime friend. Uh, tonight's show, which you're going to see in its entirety from the Sportatorium, makes reference to Bruiser on a big card coming up Friday. Obviously, Bruiser will not be with us, but stay with us. Later on, we're going to update what will happen Friday and disregard the references to Bruiser as we pick up this tape from the Sportatorium in its entirety. Okay, we're going to jump back in here from the studios now and take a moment to talk about what has happened to Bruiser Brody and what is going to happen this Friday. First of all, let me thank you for staying up late with us tonight after the Ranger game. Remind you that you will see all of championship sports here in Channel 11 tonight, just as it was taped a week ago last night at the Sportatorium in Dallas. The awkward thing about all of this is, is that the show you're watching from a week ago last Friday was taped the night before Bruiser Brody died uh, tragically in Puerto Rico. Of course, we're making references to it tonight about a big main event that had been scheduled between Bruiser and Kamala. Uh, Skandor Akbar is making reference to it in his interview tonight. We're talking about it all night long. Obviously, with Bruiser now deceased, he will not be with us this coming Friday. Uh, Kerry Von Erich will step in uh, and take Bruiser's place in the main event Friday against Kamala the Ugandan Giant. The Von Erichs, of course, have been uh, touched by this just as all of us have. They were good friends of Bruiser's. Bruiser had been their tag team partner many times. You know, Bruiser was one of the most popular wrestlers to ever set foot in the ring uh, during the 70s and 80s. Uh, here in the uh, Texas and uh, Great Southwest area, he was world famous and will be sorely missed. In fact, we're going to dedicate Friday night's card to Bruiser Brody. Uh, many of you I know would like to have a picture of Bruiser to remember him by, uh, and if you would like one, we'll be glad to give you one uh, Friday night free of charge. Those will be made available to you fans in memory of Bruiser. Uh, come join us and we'll dedicate the... Uh, night to him the card will be the same as you hear us promoting all evening long with the one exception and that is the main event between bruiser and kamala will now be Kerry von erig world heavyweight champion against kamala the ugandan giant okay we're going to continue now with excitement just as it happened the other night at the sportatorium here on championship sports Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles. I am Donnie, your host, and with me is a man I go farther back with than my recliner. It's Dale. What's up, Dale? What's up, Donnie? I'm glad to be back. How are you doing today? I'm glad to be back in the Crack House to do another episode with you, man. This is, uh, I look so forward to it now. This is awesome. Yeah, it's great. It's great to be here. I'd like to say thanks to everybody who uh, joined me last week and welcomed me in here and downloaded and shared and enjoyed our podcast and hope you keep on coming back our downloads were up people re are replying or responding messaging us leaving us input on our our podcast and man that's great i love to get feedback i got some pretty positive feedback myself done uh, that's great man because you know like i said well, i want to keep this thing going get an episode out once a week and make it fun for everybody you know give them something to listen to and hope they'll learn something because if i can go away with this and somebody's learned something they can come up to me and say i didn't know that then that's a win that's always a win all right dale we're going to get into this week's episode what we got going on this week Donnie? we are going to talk about the death of bruiser brody bruiser brody was a professional wrestler but dale when it comes to professional wrestling you either hate it or you love it but for those who love it they are not only fans they are family. The same goes for wrestlers themselves. They are family, calling each other brother, being there for each other like brothers are supposed to be. These guys are a close-knit group that cannot be matched to any athletes from other sports. Yeah, they have disagreements and arguing, but it's all about hand how you handle a situation and at the end of the day, be able to walk away from it. As for Bruiser Brody, he wasn't able to walk away. He was wheeled out on a gurney awaiting an ambulance for a trip to the hospital. All right, Dale. Bruiser was born Frank Donald Goodish on June 18, 1946 in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. And he died on July 17, 1988 at the age of 42. I'm probably butchered this name, but it's Bayamon, Puerto Rico, where he died. It's like a suburb of San Juan. Sounds right to me. Okay. 
We're going to talk a little bit about his early life. From this point on, we're going to call him Bruiser Brody, but he was born Frank Donald Goodish. Brody was a football and basketball player at Warren High School in Michigan. And Dale, he played football at West Texas A&M University, which was then known as uh, West Texas State, and later became Redskin for the NFL. Played, yep. uh, played professional football. I think he was uh, with the Redskins, uh, 69, 70, and 71, if I am correct on that. Oh, yeah, okay. He had some pseudon- other pseudonym names for wrestling. He was also known as King Kong Brody, the Mask Marauder, and Red River Jack. Right. But he became famous under the uh, ring name of Bruiser Brody. Very famous. Yeah. All right, Dale. His personal life, he was married on June 4th, 1968 to Nola Marie Nice. But the marriage ended in divorce on October 12th, 1970. Bruiser's second wife was from New Zealand, and she was Barbara Smith. Yeah, and they met in Australia. And they lived in Texas, and they had a son named Jeffrey Dean, and he was born on November 7th, 1980. Right, yeah, they, were, they met while uh, Bruiser was uh, over in Australia wrestling, and mm-hmm. she was working at the hotel. And uh, she told a funny story about that, that... Uh, they had met, and she never knew the actual Bruiser Brody. She only knew Frank. And uh, they was over there about a month or so, and then he came in one night, and all the boys had invited her up to a to a party. And it was like she was just hanging out with them because they were all friends. So she went up there, and she got to noticing that all the wrestlers started disappearing one by one. They would come by and say, well, i got to go, but I'll be back. I'll see you in a little while. And it got down, there was only three of them. And then finally the last one left, and it was just him and – or. It was just Bruiser and Barbara alone, and finally she figured out it was an all of work. That, if, that was the only way he could figure out to get her alone, oh. to have some alone time with her. So that's just how they how they met. Okay, that's pretty little cool. ingenious trick to get them together. Right. Mm-hmm. So you got to meet her. You actually met her. Yeah, I met her in Charlotte a couple of weeks ago. She's a really nice lady. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, we're we're friends now. We we uh, keep in contact, talk on Facebook, and uh, yeah, super sweet lady. Very fortunate to meet her. That's awesome. We're going to get into the the death of Bruiser Brody. Dale, it was on July 16th, 1988. Brody was in the locker room before his scheduled match with Dan Spivey. And uh, Dan's, I think his uh, ring name was Dangerous Dan, I think. Yeah. When uh, Jose Gonzalez, also known as the Invader, which was a fellow wrestler and booker, now, I've read several places he uh, he allegedly asked him to step into the shower, or he did ask him. But everything I've read and listened to, he did ask him to step into the shower. Now, I listened to a statement from Tony Atlas, and this all this happened before the match. Tony was on his sketch pad drawing pictures. He loved being an artist. He loved drawing pictures of, or portraits of people. And Brody saw that, and he's like, can you draw a picture of my son? And he was so fascinated by that, he uh, reached into his wallet and pulled out a picture of his son and was about to hand it to Tony Atlas when Jose Gonzalez asked him to step into the shower to discuss business. Right. Let's back up a second here, Donnie. Earlier in the day, they said that uh, Brody had been riding with – Jose Gonzalez and uh, Victor Jovica all week. They'd been there since Wednesday, and uh, they'd been riding together. And uh, that day of this show, they were supposed to come by the hotel and pick pick him up. Well, Alice said that he walked out of the hotel, and Dutch and Brody were both sitting out front, and he was wondering what was going on. He said that he was waiting on uh, Jose to come pick him up. So Tony said, just ride with me. Now, once they arrived at the arena, Jose Gonzalez, who is uh, invader number one, Carlos Colon, who was the owner of the territory, and uh, Victor Jovica were all sitting in the middle of the dressing room like they were having some kind of meeting, which was kind of odd to everybody that he was sitting there when he was supposed to be picking up Brody. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, they walked in, and then uh, they all sat down, and uh, that's when uh, Atlas pulled out his sketch pad, and then Brody went over to talk to him. And then that meeting kind of busted up, with Jose kind of walking off, and then when he came back, that's when he came back with a towel in his hand and asked Brody if he would talk to him in the shower. Okay. So Brody stepped into the shower to talk to Gonzalez, and he even had his the photograph in his hand. He didn't even have a chance to hand it to right. Tony Atlas. Yeah, that's right. It, yeah, it, it didn't even got to the point of actually handing that photograph over 
he was uh, to- just like totally interrupted from the conversation to step into the shower or wow. shower. I think it was a shower slash dressing room area, if I'm not mistaken. I hadn't seen any photographs of this area, but I think it's like an all in one type. It was a big because it was at a, like a baseball stadium, so it was like they had the the dressing room, and then off to the side it was like a big uh, like a group shower room. Yeah, but anyway, uh, Gonzalez asked Brody to step into the shower to discuss business, and they hadn't just been in there for just a, a few minutes, if that much, and it was an argument between the two wrestlers and a scuffle. And due to the design of the the dressing room, there were no witnesses to the altercation. Nobody actually saw the murder. Yeah, right. Way uh, Savio Vega said it was like when you walk straight into the doorway, there was like a wall blocking. So if you were standing outside, you couldn't actually see the guys in there in the shower. So it was like you walk in and had to turn right and then go around the wall to actually get into the main shower room. But there were two screams heard, and they were loud enough for the entire locker room to hear. Tony Atlas ran to the shower and saw Brody bent over holding his stomach. And that's when he looked up at Gonzalez and saw him holding a knife. Yeah, with blood dripping from it. Yeah. From his accounts, anyway. So, getting back to the Gonzalez asking Brody to step into the shower, Tony Atlas saw that Gonzalez had a towel wrapped around his hand prior to them stepping in there. Yes. So, they don't know if, if they're assuming that Gonzalez had a knife wrapped up in that towel. Yeah, everyone's uh, pretty much is uh, on board with the, he, that he had a knife concealed in that towel so that he knew what was going on before when he asked Brody into the shower. So it wouldn't have been enough time between them stepping in the shower for him to reach into a bag and pull out a knife or into a pocket or anything like that. It was, right. it was pretty much assumed that that knife was wrapped up in that towel. And two, I don't know if it was a fixed blade or a pocket knife. I've never, I've looked and I've never found anything on that, Dale. No, I didn't either. On the, the show that we watched, it was, a, you know, portrayed as a fixed blade, a large, like a Bowie type knife, especially if the, the cuts that were made were at least like eight inch cuts. So it'd have to be a pretty large blade, I would assume. Mm-hmm. Now on that shower door, like uh, speaking of Vega, way he, in his uh, interview, he said that he thought, since you had to go in and you take that wall, turn right and go in, that he thinks that uh, Jose had maybe gotten behind the, the wall. So when Brody walked in, it was just uh, he didn't have a chance. It's he almost was, like uh, an ambush. Yeah, like and he don't. He said, "Well, you know, he could even throw the towel in his face. Nobody knows what happened, but that's what he was thinking. That as soon as he come around the corner, he probably stabbed him. As soon as he come around mm-hmm. the corner, because he went in first. So there were there were two stab wounds, correct? There were actually three. There were two eight inch stab wounds on the front. Which one would have, it actually had punctured his liver and uh, pierced his lung and severed some arteries to his heart. But there was a small superficial cut on his back, which would have made the third one. Mm-hmm. Was there a, a gash in his intestine area? Uh, that is what they're saying, yes. Yeah. The lower abdomen. Mm-hmm. Okay. Brody was laying on the floor at this time. That's when uh, they got him laid down. But there was a problem of getting an ambulance there right. that night. Yeah. There were there were several several problems with this getting help there. One, Dale, there was heavy traffic that night. A lot of traffic. There were there was people trying to get to this event, and also uh, there was a Menudo concert that night. Yeah, next door in the, in the venue next door there was Menudo was playing. And um, for those of you who don't know, Menudo was a, a boy band back in this year, back yeah, in uh, eighty eight. Yeah, it was, it was prior to New Kids on the Block and all that stuff, but. It was like a like a double jeopardy thing. They, they could not get to the to the ring to get Brody, but and also it was prior nine one one. Correct. And they said that uh, they had made a call, but they didn't know if it got out or got through. And then uh, even uh, uh, Victor uh, Kionez had uh, went and put the the word out to the local radio stations to let them know that they there was a ambulance desperately needed at the at the stadium. And everything I've read and, and heard, Dale, that they were, it took them almost 45 minutes to an hour to get to the stadium to get Brody. Yeah, at least 45 minutes, yep. Yeah. All right, when they got there. Which means he was laying there bleeding for 45 minutes. Yeah, bleeding out. All right, when they got there, the medical workers, I heard, were pretty small guys. Yeah. They were. They could not even lift Brody up off the floor. Well, Brody was a big guy. He was around between what you say, from six five to six eight to a little three hundred something pounds. So yeah, he was a pretty big fellow. Yeah, I've heard anything from uh, 
three hundred five to three twenty. Right, what he what he weighed. So uh, big man, big dude. Tony Atlas physically picked him up, and I mean, and I heard also heard too that uh, Brody told him said don't don't overdo it. He said, man, I I, I bench pressed more than this than you weigh. So and it was, it was almost a chuckle there. When he said that, yeah, he said I, I curl more than you, brother. Yeah, because because uh, <laughs> in the interview, uh, he made sure to put himself over saying that at this time I weighed three oh seven and I bench six fifty. So Tony, he's always going to put himself over there. Oh yeah, so he got uh, Brody and put him on the gurney and went with him. Tony Atlas went with him to the hospital. Yep, he got him to the hospital, and Brody still had that photograph in his hand. Yep, the whole time he was laying there on the floor at the venue holding his stomach bleeding out and still had the picture of his son in his hand he loved his boy that he didn't give to tony atlas and he had that photograph all the way to the hospital tony didn't get to stay at the hospital he stayed there for a while but he he was mad he was irritated at the whole situation i think they actually had asked him to leave didn't they yeah they did but uh before that he was he was pretty ill his patience was uh growing thin he couldn't get anybody to come and look at him and uh he went in there and told him, he said, I need a doctor to come look at my friend. And they said, well, you don't understand. Stabbings here in Puerto Rico are basically like a cold in the United States. It's no big deal. They happen all the time. And he said, I don't think you understand. You need to come see my friend. Well, the doctor blew him off again. Well, when he did, Atlas physically picked the doctor up, threw him over his shoulder, took him into the room, and basically forced him to look at him. And then the doctor seen it and how serious the situation was. Mm-hmm. So, that, I mean, there was a lot of time passed between the stabbing and getting treatment. Yes. I mean, I don't know. I've never heard how much time it was, but it was a lot. Yeah, very, yeah a long time. And then uh, they said you know, they basically was two procedures that they'd done right away and, and pretty much told Atlas that his friend was stable and then uh, he should probably leave because he was pretty much scaring everybody there because he was punching walls and stomping up and down the hall. He was, he was pretty upset. Mm-hmm. So they told... Tony Atlas, that they had uh, fixed the area, I think, in around his liver. They took care of that part, and they were working on the intestine area. And Tony left the hospital. Yeah, and went back to the arena. Yeah. And they had told Tony, too, that they had uh, Bruiser Brody stable. Correct. They, they was gonna, he was going to be okay. So he went back to the venue, to the wrestling match. He got back, got in the dressing room, and Dale, I think about this time, some of the matches were over with, and some of the guys were in the dressing room talking about their matches. Everything was upbeat. They were laughing, joking, carrying on about the, the Cel- matches. Celebrating how good a job they did, yeah, and, this kind of thing. And nothing, nothing was being said about Bruiser Brody. Even though his blood was still on the floor. Yeah. It was almost like they tried to sweep it under the rug or shower at that time. You know, it was like... You know, let's move on. Let's get this. Let's get this going. Right, and Tony was pretty upset by this. He said in uh, in his interview that uh, he actually took a chair and picked it up and slammed it up against the wall and couldn't understand why people were joking and laughing when his friend was laying in the hospital and could die at any minute. And uh, said the security come to told him he needed to calm it down a little bit. That those fans get wild sometimes. And he said, "Well, what do you mean those fans?" He goes. Well, everybody here is telling me that it was a fan that stabbed him outside, and he comes stumbling in the in the dressing room, and he goes, "Well, that ain't right. That fella right there did it." And he pointed over at uh, the Invader One and said, "Jose is the one that stabbed him. wasn't no fan. I saw it." That's right. And to let everybody know a little bit about Bruiser Brody, he was a um, very much into his character in the ring. I mean, he he was he sold out stadiums. And ain't that right, Dale? That's right. He was he was a main attraction. When he showed up, tickets were sold. Yeah, he put butts in seats, as the boys say. Oh, yeah. And he sort of went against the grain as far as wrestling and what promoters and people who booked the, these matches wanted. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted a final say-so in everything. Every match, he did not want – anybody telling him how to run a match right he was going to keep his character strong no matter what and he might agree to what you say we're going to do and who's going to win or who's going to lose but then at the end he's pretty much going to do what he wants to do he, even if he has to change the finish in the ring he'll agree to it back but then come out in the ring he's not going to look weak when he leaves i mean he, he even took his character to the next level you know when he would go out in public he took his character with him and when you see him coming into a match he carried a chain 
slinging a chain around over his head. And he wouldn't even take this out with him. When he was out in public, he had that chain with him. So he, he lived his, his part. Stay strong, make money. That's right. But there, too, you know, like you getting back to his wife and uh, his personal life, his family life, he was totally different. Yep. When he was home, he was frank. Yep. He was a dad. He was everything I've read and heard. He was a super dad. Yep. Super great dad. We're going to post pictures of him on our Facebook and Instagram of, of Bruiser Brody, you know, with his family and plus pictures of him in the ring. And, and you can see the difference in the attitude with his son than the job he had as a professional wrestler. I mean, it's just, it's like night and day, but he, he, knew, he knew when to turn it on and when to turn it off. Right. And he kept them separate. Yes, yes, he did. All right, Dale, let's get into the the Gonzalez, the trial, and what was done with him for the stabbing of Bruiser Brody. All right. Well, basically, they went, after they talked to some fellas that night after the matches, they talked to uh, Dutch Mantel. They talked to Tony Atlas. They couldn't get a whole lot of witnesses, which is kind of shocking to me when you have a whole room full of people in there. I mean, not a lot of people want to talk, but I guess I can understand that if you're – especially a few of the Puerto Rican guys, you have to live there. So, And Cologne had a lot of pull on that island. So, you know, it was pretty much going to go the way he wants it to go. But once they learned that it was uh, Jose that did it, they act like they was going to take him and indict him for a first-degree murder. But they wanted to, they did a lot of interviews that night and talked to a lot of people. He never was arrested for this, was he? No. He, he turned himself in, is that correct? Yeah. And see, actually that day, he came out of the locker room after he had stabbed him Whenever he walked by Brody, got his keys and left, and he went somewhere. And then when he came back, and he actually wrestled that night. He wasn't even sent home. He wasn't fired from his job. Anything. He actually wrestled, performed that night. The only thing he left, I think, was just to get rid of the knife because it's never been found. Yeah. All right. They went to trial for this. Gonzalez yeah. went to trial. Well, first they uh, delayed the trial <laughs> because they were going to do it for uh, first degree murder. And once they told all the American guys, they told Dutch, told Tony and all them, just go ahead and go. When uh, we get ready to have the trial, we will send you subpoenas. We will fly you guys in, put you up in hotels, and uh, you will be the witnesses in, uh, for this because you are all you are the eyewitnesses. Mm-hmm. They were the main witnesses. Even though they didn't actually see the murder, they saw the after effect, and they heard the scuffle and the, the fight ensuing. Right. So then uh, Dutch Mantel says that he got a letter saying that they were going to change the date of the trial to a different date and at this time they had decided they were going to do it for involuntary manslaughter mm-hmm. and uh the next statement he got came after the trial was already over so they had somebody had left this on their desk and then didn't send it and then once he got his subpoena the trial was already over and he already knew the outcome and atlas says he was never ever uh, reached out to as far as coming back down there and telling what he knew all right, Dale, tell us the outcome of this trial. Well, the outcome was uh, what they did is a, uh, a couple weeks after this happened, they brought Invader back on TV. They turned him face. Well, they turned him to a good guy, make him good, and they went into the court. So basically, when he went to the ring, he was the good guy now. Yeah. Yeah, he was. They made him a good guy. They, they changed his character and his his whole wrestling demeanor. Right. And then uh, they went into the trial, and the only people there – for the prosecution was actually the doctors who had taken care of Brody and they told what everyone had told them they basically told them that all that was hearsay and Gonzalez was set free and was never charged with anything and, and he got off uh, saying it was self defense self defense yep they showed a lot of pictures of a lot of pictures a lot of videos and stuff and he was saying how scared he was of Brody and showed not they didn't show anything of Frank it was all the crazy wild man antics of Brody and he told him how scared he was of the guy and what happened, and he said it was all self-defense, and there was nobody there to to say anything for Brody. So basically, they let him off of the self-defense, and he's still free today. Hmm. Dutch Mantel and Tony Atlas, they were you know fellow wrestlers who witnessed the killing, and they have said that in the '70s when Brody and Gonzalez had wrestled each other, Brody had wrestled very rough with the result of beating up Gonzalez. Yep. Atlas even quoted that Gonzalez, while on the way to the hospital, vowed to fellow wrestlers 
that he would kill Brody one day. Yep. She's uh, Special Delivery Jones. Allison Special Delivery Jones, or SD Jones, was taking yeah. him to the hospital. And uh, on the way there, he said, uh, yeah, I'll kill that guy one day. So, but, so basically, uh, Gonzalez has got away with murder. Yep, I think so. Why was there never a, a civil trial on this? Is it is it something about Puerto Rico? Because, you know, me and you discussed, you know, off the air earlier about, you know, they're, they're a province of the United States. They're – yeah. Uh, I would think they'd have the same laws, the same uh, way of doing things as far as, you know, criminal well, justice. Well, you'd think it would, but during this trial, you definitely can see that it was not the same there as it was here. And uh, Barbara had said that uh, there's a lot of people who had actually tried to get them to do that, but I don't think that in her mind she just thought it was worth it to, to even go back down there to, to do it because just the way that it was done in the trial, she figured it would be the same way here. So there's no uh, wrongful death suit at all then? No, no, not that I know of. Do you know where Gonzalez is today, what what he's up to, where he's at, or anything like that? Well, according to uh, the episode of like Dark Side of the Ring that we watched, he's still there. He's still prominent and even has on his Facebook page that he'll show up as invader to your child's birthday party if you'd like him to. Wow. So he's still a hero all this time later after he got away with murder. In he's Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico. Well, that's crazy, man. All right. You talked to uh, Bruiser Brody's wife. How is she doing today? What What is she up to now? What? Well, she's uh, she's got a book out called Brody, The Triumph and Tragedy of Wrestling's Rebel. Uh, she's doing a lot of traveling. I think she lives in Florida. So uh hope you're safe down there from this hurricane there, Barb. Um, she does a lot of uh, like comic cons and wrestling conventions. She's coming in and doing Q and A's and stuff like that. And uh, mm-hmm. I think she's uh, she's pretty happy, from what I could tell, to be brought back into the wrestling family, which uh, she had missed for so long. So her and uh, other ones like uh, Karen McDaniel, who is a uh, widow of uh, Wahoo McDaniel, and a couple other ladies like uh, Bobby Heenan's wife, who was also there. They uh, they miss their wrestling family, and when they come back down, and they're really just taken in and just like they never missed a beat it, it really means a lot to them that's great plus the fans i mean they come to these conventions and stuff and like you know we said at the beginning of this podcast it's all family yeah i mean they, they they take each other in and it's just it's amazing to see the the bond between the wrestlers the fans and the community of wrestling professional wrestling yep a lot of great people i've met a lot of great people through wrestling i'm a, I'm a big fan and anybody who knows me knows that so that's great, man. I mean, I hate that uh, justice wasn't served in Bro- Bruiser Brody's death. I mean, it is a sad tragedy. Yeah, nobody really knows why it came about. And then, and they were actually riding together that whole week, and nothing was ever done. Now, it go- could go back to history, you know, because uh, back to that 70s match when uh, Brody really beat him down, as Tony Allen said, his head was swole up the size of a pumpkin. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know he said it was pretty bad. But then also the 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 territory down there in Puerto Rico owed Brody quite a bit of money. They owed him about twenty five thousand dollars, from what I could find out. And uh, he had told Atlas that he was finally in, which he took as that maybe he had bought into the territory. Now I hadn't found out anything about this, but to me maybe I'm thinking maybe they owed him a lot of money. He wanted in the territory. Maybe they figured they would trade him out. Well, we'll sell you part of the territory. For this and not money. have to pay you all that money back. Yeah, now I don't know if that's true or not, but that's just me speculating because mm-hmm. they said that uh, Victor Quiones, they thought, was trying to border a deal for Gorilla Monsoon to sell part his part out to Brody, which would make him part owner. And uh, he had made the statement that if he was part owner, there would be lots of changes going on there. Basically, he would get rid of uh, Invader because uh, he didn't really have a lot of respect for him. He had always belittled him in, uh, in front of the boys and, mm-hmm. and talked a lot about him. And so... And also, Invader had uh, lost his daughter a, a couple months before this in a drowning accident. And do you no, think that affected his mind in any way? I do. I think he's probably on edge, pretty bad on that. That would that would that would really bother me. Uh, I don't even know if I could be around anybody. Truthfully, that would that would bother me quite a bit. And then coming into the news of the rumors that Brody may be buying into the territory, and now he might lose his job from this guy that he he really hated. It probably could have made, could have pushed him over the edge. You, you never know. And mm-hmm. then uh, also, there's a talk of uh, Carlos Colon and Jovica really getting on Jose about doing his job and being the booker, and he should have respect in the locker room, and he need to go and push these guys around a little bit and let him know he was boss. And 
you know how that works with Brody. Brody's they ain't nobody's boss, but maybe Barbara. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, as far as uh, Brody goes, he Brody does what Brody wants to do. You know, he didn't really have any respect at all for Jose, so it wasn't gonna do do much for him to tell him what to do. Yeah. Well, like like I say, end of the day, it was murder and. Brody's no longer with us, right? And it's sad because he was, at that time, he was the biggest star in the world, yeah, in the wrestling world, anyway. Yep, and uh, he filled stadiums, like we said. I mean, he was he was the man. All right, Dale, this is a sad tragedy for Bruiser Brody, but I hope our listeners got something out of this. I hope you know they learned something. I definitely learned something studying this this case. Um, I didn't know all the the details, but it's sad that you know. Nobody's brought to justice for this murder. Yeah, it is really sad. Uh, life was lost, and basically all they were saying is one's gone. We got to protect the other. So basically, they did everything they could do to save their butts, save their territory, and uh, save the invader. Yeah, and it, it really, it's really sad that they uh, did all that. And I don't know. And Brody's gone. Yep. All right. We want everybody to weigh in on this case. Leave your comments, suggestions. Also. Um, Check out our Facebook page. Check out our Instagram, Twitter. Go to our website. There's a store page on there. We got T-shirts, mugs, um, cell phone cases, anything you like. Also, we're in the process of getting some more merchandise printed up, some T-shirts and more stickers. If you ever see us out, ask us for a sticker. We'll, we'll give you something. Yeah, we'll hook you up. We're getting some new shirts in. Some stuff to be looking really cool. Can't wait. Uh, if any of you guys uh, have any other ideas about why you think this might have happened, if I'm terribly off base and I don't know, I'd love to hear what you think about it. Because after doing a lot of research, I'm, I still don't know a whole lot more than I did. We know a lot of more details, but as far as why and all that, I don't think anybody knows except for maybe Carlos Colon and Jovica maybe. And Keon is, but he's dead, so he can't tell nobody. Yep. Dead men tell no tales. It is true. All right, Dale. We're going to get out of here. With all that being said, this is The, the Crack, Crack House Chronicles. Chronicles.